thank you all for having me down here this morning. I'm going to actually get out and move around a little bit. Uh, I'm very uncomfortable standing behind podiums, and so most of my students are used to watching me go back and forth and back and forth. And I've learned over the years that if you do this enough, you can actually put your, uh, your less interested students to sleep, and that's not necessarily a bad thing either. In any case, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the influence of the American Revolution and revolutionary ideas on Latin America. And the first point I wanted to start off by making uh, is that, as you can see from the map, uh, what constituted Latin America at the time of independence is actually a pretty big chunk of real estate uh, stretching from the northwestern uh, United States all the way down through the tip of South America. So when you think about the amount of variation that you could find even within the American Revolution in terms of, for example, uh, how Southerners felt about the conflict as opposed to Northerners, some of the different dynamics in terms of participation. Uh, that is going to be true on a much larger scale in Latin America. And, and that was actually one of the points behind the, uh, the uh, article on the American Revolution and the Caribbean. Uh, that I had uh, made uh, available for your, uh, for your reading. Uh, and that was that the point was, you know, it's complicated when we talk about these things, that uh, above and beyond what we might expect to be <clears throat> expected influences, there are a lot of unexpected influences as well. So for example, in, in Franklin Knight's article, uh, he points out that perhaps the biggest disruption uh, produced by the American Revolution was not ideological or political, but rather economic, and that that would in turn have a ripple effect across the Caribbean. So there we have it. In the case of the Caribbean, uh, we might assume that the American Revolution would almost immediately breathe life into anti-slavery movements, for example, in places like uh, Haiti and uh, Cuba. N not necessarily. Uh, it's not to say that, uh, that that does not play a role, but it's certainly not the only role that is played. And so when we look at the whole of Latin America, one of the things I like to point out to students early on is that some of what we're going to talk about, even if we're talking about the next several hundred years of Latin American history, is relatively predictable if you know a little bit about the demographics. Because that's what's really going to shape local reactions to or responses to revolutionary sentiment. Uh, so for example, areas like Mexico, or the Andes, uh, both of which were the hearts of the uh, Aztec and Incan civilizations respectively, uh, are both areas that had large, sedentary, very advanced civilizations. Uh, they are living literally in cities. Uh, what this means is that when the Spaniards arrive, they are literally, in every sense of the word, going to be cohabitating with these indigenous peoples, as opposed to displacing them, which was largely the experience uh, in the uh, northeastern United States prior to uh, independence. Uh, there will be other parts of Latin America, for example, uh, along the northern coast, what is today Venezuela, that has a relatively small indigenous population. Uh, moreover, it is not a sedentary one, so that when Spanish settlement does arrive, many of these indigenous people are simply displaced to the interior. Uh, Argentina, or what is today Argentina, had almost no indigenous population to speak of. Uh, so we shouldn't be surprised when several hundred years later, uh, the makeup of the uh, country is largely of European descent. And that's going to produce a very different response to independence uh, era initiatives than we might find in, say, Brazil. Uh, Brazil is not only a Portuguese colony as opposed to a Spanish one, uh, it too lacked a large sedentary indigenous population. So here we have indigenous people simply being displaced by Europeans. Uh, they are oftentimes outnumbered. Uh, although in the case of a place like Brazil or perhaps the Caribbean, uh, any demographic advantage that European newcomers had quickly evaporates when they begin to import African slaves wholesale. So if we know that Brazil ends up being uh, founded largely on plantation-style slavery, like the southern United States, uh, the Caribbean is going to follow suit. Uh, if we know that uh, what is today Peru and Bolivia are the heart of what used to be the Incan Empire, and uh, north-central Mexico is the heart of what was the Aztec Empire, those are going to be the areas where racial pressures or tensions are going to dictate in a very big way the outcome of revolutionary movements, uh, simply because they're very different. 
And typically speaking, where we have the largest concentration of either indigenous peoples, African peoples, or both. So for example, there's a term that pops up in uh, Bolivar's letters, Pardo, P-A-R-D-O, simply means people of color. Uh, could mean that they are descendants of Europeans and Spanish. It could be that they are descendants of Europeans and Africans. They could be descendants of Indians and Africans. Uh, but in any case, these are people of color. And in most parts of Latin America, they greatly outnumber their European counterparts. And I think the uh, the last figure I saw was that they estimated that by about 1800, uh, so just before, just before Latin American independence, as much as 80 to 85 percent of the population throughout Latin America would have still been considered indigenous and or African. So this is at a point when the white population has actually grown considerably. It's still relatively small. So we're going to have several different paths that we're going to talk about, and they're fairly representative, uh, meaning that uh, Argentina is a very unique part of Latin America in as much as it does not have a large indigenous population, nor does it have a large uh, African population. Uh, as we're going to see, Argentina's path to independence is going to be arguably the smoothest of all the Latin American republics, in large part due to this relative absence of fear of what might transpire were we to start mobilizing the masses. And this is the big fear throughout Latin America uh, in years leading to and even after independence is the fear of a race war or caste war. And this, this is their, their, their overarching fear. So the kind of fears that we would have found in southern planters in the United States, they are very widespread across many areas of Latin America. Again, not so much Argentina. Uh, there we have relative racial homogeneity and uh, their, their uh, be, uh, behavior moving forward, pretty consensual. Uh, Mexico is going to be somewhat different. Uh, as a result of the large indigenous population there. And there's a term that I'm going to need to introduce, and that term is Creole. Creole actually refers to Spaniards who had the misfortune of being born on these shores as opposed to European ones. Uh, and what this meant, at least in terms of the Spanish Empire, was that they were viewed as being somehow tainted. They're still considered European, they're still considered Spanish, they do not have all the rights or privileges of Spaniards actually born in Spain. Uh, in Mexico, and in fact in many parts of Latin America, we're going to find that it's this Creole population that is most smitten with the American Revolution, uh, Enlightenment era ideas, and even the subsequent French Revolution uh, and beyond. Um, we do have a revolution that will come from below in Mexico, meaning we're going to have an honest-to-God grassroots movement uh, led by people of color. It is going to absolutely terrify the elite in the colony, including these Creoles. The people that I just mentioned are actually pretty smitten with the idea of independence, and yet they're terrified of an independence movement led by people of color. So what we're going to actually find in the case of Mexico, a series of revolutions one of which might actually be considered revolutionary, this movement from below, uh, the one being led by both the Spaniards and the Creole population would be actually be a counter-revolution. And I can recall the first uh, Latin American history course I ever took uh, being really surprised to hear the professor describe revolutions in Latin America as having been essentially counter-revolutionary. I thought, wow, what, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, and, and his argument was that they weren't as revolutionary as they might appear on paper, uh, that they were essentially very conservative movements designed to protect large elements of the status quo. And we'll get, get to more on that later. Uh, Venezuela, uh, like Mexico, uh, has a small Creole class, uh, mainly a planting class. Uh, these are folks who are involved in cacao for, uh, farming. Uh, so, yeah, the chocolate bean. Uh, they are going to embrace independence relatively quickly uh, because they love the idea of free trade. So it's going to be an economic issue for them. Uh, by the same token, uh, we're going to see multiple revolutions breaking out in Venezuela just as they did in Mexico. Uh, and what will make the Spaniards' job easier for them, at least initially, are all of these divisions amongst the Americans themselves. So in the case of Venezuela, 
uh, we're going to have at least three separate groups, not counting the Spanish, involved in the conflict. Uh, we're going to have these uh, American-born Spanish, the Creoles. Uh, we are going to have pardos, or rather people of color. They may or may not be slaves. And we have what they call llaneros, which are cowboys that are almost always, by definition, people of color. And they're all fighting for different things. And again, divide and conquer uh, provides the Spaniards with a, uh, an MO for preventing uh, a successful independence movement, at least for some time. Uh, Peru has the single largest indigenous population in the Americas. Uh, probably no surprise that Peru will be the very last part of Latin America to be dragged kicking and screaming into the modern era. Uh, it will literally be liberated from the outside by Generals Bolivar and San Martin. So Peru rem remains that last loyal stronghold uh, in the Americas, uh, not because the Creole population there is any more or less enamored with Spanish rule than the, their counterparts elsewhere, but simply due to fear of racial uprisings. And uh, as we're going to see, they, they, those fears were uh, very real to them, and then nothing made up. They had good reason to fear some of these things. Uh, in terms of some maybe general observations, uh, in terms of, well, what similarities do all of these Spanish colonies have in common with one another? To what extent do they share similar influences or commonalities with uh, the North American colonies? Uh, let me start off with something called the Bourbon Reforms. And for those of you who've taught American history, you may remember uh, something we used to refer to as a period of salutary neglect. Right, and that's, that's this period during which the British are so occupied in these overseas struggles uh, that they simply have to turn essentially a blind eye to the fact that their American colonists aren't doing a very good job of paying their taxes, following the laws. Of course, they're trading illegally with the West Indies. That's how John Hancock makes his fortune. Uh, but the English are well aware of what their colonists or rather subjects are doing, and they have every intent of reeling them back in once the Seven Years' War is concluded in the mid-1700s. Uh, there's something very similar in Spanish America. Uh, it's not necessarily a period of salutary neglect or even benign neglect, uh, perhaps ignorant and willful neglect. Uh, the Habsburg dynasty that had ruled Spain since uh, the time of, uh, of uh, Ferdinand and Isabella uh, will die out in Spain in 1701 with the death of the last Habsburg monarch. And it's going to trigger something called the War of the Spanish Succession. Uh, what we now know is that the period of the 1600s was one in which the Habsburg dynasty had very little contact with its American colonies and very little influence in its American colonies. Uh, for the most part, the colonies were left largely to their own devices. And what that meant was that an awful lot of these American-born peoples, including especially the Creoles, uh, found that there were ways of uh, obtaining the kinds of privileges or perks that might have otherwise been denied them. Uh, in any case, uh, by 1713, when the War of the Spanish Succession comes to an end and the Bourbons uh, take control of Spain, they're absolutely horrified to find that the coffers are literally empty. They discover that periods as long as 10 and 15 years would transpire in which there was no contact other than economic between mother country and colonies. Uh, and this is something that the Bourbons aim to rectify. And they're going to send some royal investigators over. Uh, they're going to come up with a series of ideas for how to make the colonies once again profitable. And they're going to be incredibly, incredibly successful. Of course, those profits come at the expense of the Americans themselves. Um, these are collectively known as, again, the Bourbon Reforms. So we're going to see things that are similar to what you would find here in the United States uh, leading up to the Revolution. New taxes. Uh, enforcement of old taxes, the raising of taxes. Uh, we're going to see, for example, in Latin America, the reestablishing of something called the Indian head tax, whereby you pay a tax simply because you're an Indian. This was something that had kind of fallen by the wayside for about 100 years. It's, it's resurrected. Uh, they are going to establish state-controlled monopolies. In particular, they hated Estanco, which is a monopoly on the growing and sale of tobacco, which had become a very, very uh, popular and 
a, a very lucrative uh, undertaking for many, many Latin American peoples, regardless of race. Uh, they're going to expand the bureaucracy, uh, and they're going to ensure that only Spaniards born in Spain occupy key positions in the bureaucracy. Uh, so again, they are going to succeed, the Bourbons, in making their American colonies far, far more profitable than they had been under the Habsburgs. They are also going to succeed in triggering a wave of resentment amongst American elites. And again, especially the Creoles, uh, but not limited to Creoles. Uh, you don't necessarily hear the phrase, well, no taxation without representation, but that is absolutely the sentiment under which many Latin Americans are living by the late 1700s. Uh, the rules of the game have been changed seemingly overnight, uh, and of course they are now discovering that the very game that they had learned to play so well uh, just several decades earlier is really now rigged against them. Uh, so again, this is going to be, become one of the, uh, the, the earliest and perhaps most important factors in helping to explain, excuse me, uh, why after all these hundreds of years, Latin American subjects suddenly decide, or maybe not so suddenly decide, uh, that perhaps the time has come for a change in the relationship with the mother country. Uh, we're going to also see some of the same intellectual precursors to the revolutions or uh, independence movements in Latin America that we saw in the United States. Uh, England's glorious revolution, which brings about the constitutional monarchy in Britain back in 1688, uh, incredibly influential, perhaps even more influential than the American Revolution. Uh, you'll find that uh, political leaders like Simon Bolivar uh, as much as he loved and respected and venerated the United States, just did not believe in his heart of hearts that our system would work for Latin Americans. Uh, in fact, uh, he, he often bemoaned that the uh, triple yoke of ignorance, superstition, and vice uh, practically guaranteed that Latin Americans would be unable to achieve what their North American counterparts had. Uh, so again, sees a lot to like about the American Revolution, but ultimately feels more comfortable with a stronger, more centralized government. May or may not have to be a monarchy, but again, the Glorious Revolution, uh, the British uh, political system is something you're going to find Latin Americans talking about uh, very optimistically, very positively for quite some time. Uh, Enlightenment era philosophers um, might interest you to know that Simon Bolivar, uh, no matter where he was at, no matter what military uh, campaign he was embarked upon, he carried books with him absolutely everywhere, uh, literally trunks of books. And the three with which, uh, or from which he refused to be parted uh, were Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, the Baron de Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws, and Voltaire's letters. So an incredibly, incredibly learned man. Uh, I should point out that it's not nearly as easy to obtain these books in South America as it is in North America by virtue of the Inquisition. Like the Inquisition is charged amongst its many duties with preventing dangerous ideas or dangerous literature from entering the hands of their citizens and subjects. Uh, now, what we've discovered is that uh, quite a few of these books make it to the Americas regardless. They show up in private libraries, usually of priests. Okay, So the very people who were charged with making sure this stuff didn't get out into circulation, oftentimes the ones bringing it over. And so uh, we're going to find that a lot of these religious figures become key figures in the independence movements because, of course, they're the ones who are oftentimes first exposed to these Enlightenment era ideas. And then, of course, finally, we have the American Revolution itself, a very, very close geographical and a very close chronological, hey, this just occurred, this isn't ancient Greece or Rome, uh, successful democratic revolution. Uh, if nothing else, the American dem uh, Revolution demonstrates that it is absolutely possible for former colonies to establish their independence. And so we, we will find throughout the Americas individuals who would love nothing more than to recreate the United States experiment on the Latin American stage. They are actually in the minority. Uh, Lorenzo de Zavala, for whom so many schools in this state are named, uh, was once upon a time a Mexican-born citizen who was the mayor of Mexico City, uh, and he was 100% dedicated 
to creating a United States-based political system in Mexico. Uh, when that fails, he ultimately leaves, uh, takes root in Texas, and remains here after the revolution. So again, you will find individuals who uh, thought that the American Revolution wasn't just something to be honored, it was something to be followed like a blueprint. Uh, for the most part, they don't quite see it in those terms. Okay, so I, I promised that I would give a sense of why so many of these Latin American Creoles, these Spanish-born, or rather American-born Spaniards, uh, would be so fearful of triggering a caste or race war. And, and I thought that what I would do is point to several key events that had occurred in relatively recent years. So we're, we're, we're not talking about every village uh, uprising or Indian rebellion across Latin America, uh, of which there were literally hundreds if not thousands during the colonial period. Uh, rather, let's look at what is occurring in the immediate aftermath of these urban reforms. Again, the sudden changing of the rules for the American people. Uh, in 1780 and 81, in what is today Peru and Bolivia, we are going to see something uh, emerging called the Tupac Amaru insurrection. Uh, it's led by a man of mixed blood uh, who actually is descended from Tupac Amaru. And Tupac Amaru was the very last Incan emperor. And so in adopting the name Tupac Amaru II, he's immediately making a link to his indigenous past. Uh, and this will be a largely indigenous movement of people rebelling against various and sundry of the Bourbon reforms. Uh, I should point out that they are not undertaking anything necessarily revolutionary. Uh, the most commonly heard uh, call or refrain was, long live the king, death to bad government. So again, no, no, no challenging of the monar uh, monarchy, no challenging of the king's uh, authority or uh, legitimacy, uh, simply reactions to or challenges to specific pieces of legislation or acts. Uh, while Tupac Amaru II does try to make this a cross-class or cross-race caste uh, uh, movement, uh, for the most part, not very successful. Uh, what we are going to see instead are two years of conflict in the Andes in which uh, some of these groups demonstrate a very, very disturbing inability to differentiate between Spaniards born in Spain and Spaniards born in the Americas. They all look alike to these folks. Uh, we do not see a race war. We see the fear of a race war. And so in 1780-81, Creoles who have already begun to meet in secret to start talking about some of these Enlightenment era writers I've mentioned, to start considering uh, perhaps a remapping or a remaking of the relationship between colony and mother country, uh, they immediately uh, unite uh, with their Spanish brethren uh, in an effort to put this down. One year later, uh, if we move to what is today Colombia, uh, we're going to find a similar movement. Uh, this time uh, we do involve uh, other various racial groups, so it's not just these uh, American-born Spaniards. We will have some indigenous people and some African people, mixed blood people. Uh, and this is a movement that challenges the tobacco monopoly. So once again, uh, long live the king, death to bad government. Uh, they will be successful in capturing the viceroy, who's the king's personal representative in the Americas, uh, and forcing him to uh, compromise. And so what they're going to do is they are going to, uh, at least temporarily, uh, end the tobacco monopoly. And, of course, now that the, uh, now that the Comuneros, as they were known, uh, have achieved their main goal, they are going to disperse. They're going to return back home to their towns and uh, farms. And about six months later, in the middle of the night, Spanish authorities are going to come through. They're going to round up all of the perceived ringleaders, and they're going to execute every last one of them. So, again, didn't quite have the fear of a racial rebellion or a race war, uh, but there were concerns. Of course, the Haitian Revolution, uh, something that uh, uh, Bolivar very pointedly hoped to avoid. Uh, Bolivar, again, an interesting person. Uh, he owned slaves in his lifetime, but he was also raised by a slave. He was orphaned by the time he was nine years old, and so he had a slave woman who basically served as his mother. Uh, by the time he was an adult, he was anti-slavery, freed his own slaves. 
However, he feared that pushing for the abolition of slavery in general would provoke more problems than it was worth. He feared that he would lose the support of other planters, and he feared that it would suddenly become a race war in the Americas. And, and, and that wasn't his intent. Now, he'll, he'll have to change the way he thinks uh, later on during the independence movement. But in any case, uh, the great fear is that any part of Latin America could become another Haiti, literally an island of fire with caste or race warfare. Uh, by the late 1700s, we're starting to see copycat movements, uh, especially around the Caribbean Rim. Uh, the Bahian conspiracy is actually something occurring in Brazil in 1798, uh, as ships dock in Salvador de Bahia, and they're docking from Caribbean ports, they bring news of the revolution in Haiti. And this quickly spreads to slaves living in northeast Brazil, and uh, they end up with an abortive conspiracy to overthrow the government, abolish slavery. They're actually found out. That's why it's an abortive movement. Uh, there's another one called the Coro Rebellion uh, in Venezuela in the early 1800s. And again, that too will be put down. Uh, in, in any case, if we're looking just at the period from, say, 1780 to 1800, this is 20 years during which many Latin American elite, meaning, again, these American-born Spaniards or Portuguese, see plenty of evidence around them of how things can go wrong or get out of hand if you're forced to mobilize the masses. So again, they're, they're very fearful of making big changes uh, that they would ultimately not be able to control. Okay, so we have the Creole elite of Latin America. Uh, they would very much like to change the nature of their relationship with their mother country. Uh, they're very fearful of doing anything. Uh, the people of color, uh, mixed race individuals, uh, they have rebelled on occasion, uh, only to find that they are met uh, in no uncertain terms with a rather violent and hasty response on behalf of the Spaniards and Creoles. Uh, so what finally gives, and ultimately what will give, is Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, here on the left, uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, of course, an outgrowth of the French Revolution, uh, Napoleon's forces will enter Spain and Portugal, uh, and Napoleon will place Ferdinand VII under house arrest. Uh, he will then, and this is in 1808, replace him with his brother Joseph Bonaparte. Okay, what a great opportunity for the nobility in Spain and maybe the quasi-nobility or aristocracy of the America uh, to step in and take some steps of their own. Uh, and it all begins in Spain, where the nobility have watched as their privileges and power have been eroded over the course of centuries. Uh, what the nobility will do is in the year 1810, so two years later, of course, the Span uh, much of Spain still occupied by French troops. Uh, the Spanish nobility is going to meet and form a junta, literally like a little parliament or a representative assembly. And they're going to argue that in the absence of the legitimate king who's imprisoned, uh, sovereignty reverts to the people, which is a very Republican, Enlightenment era kind of idea. You can see who they've been reading. Uh, and what they're going to do is take it upon themselves to rule Spain and the empire as they believe, wink, wink, that Ferdinand VII would have them rule it. So, for example, they're convinced that Ferdinand would love nothing more than to be bound by a constitution, and a very liberal one at that. And so they're going to write a liberal constitution that they will pass, and it kind of goes on from there. In any case, here in the Americas, Creoles are paying attention. They say, well, wait a minute. The same principle that has allowed our counterparts in Spain to take control of their own affairs during this unpleasantness allows us to do the same. And so what we're going to see across Latin America are Creole-led movements trying to take advantage of this opportunity to essentially establish self-rule. Uh, very few of them, at least at this early point, are seriously thinking self-rule in the form of independence. 
Uh, they would like to see constitutional rule. They would like to see more representative uh, elements brought into the relationship with Spain. Uh, but again, very few are actively thinking, let's go for independence. And I recall, you know, when I teach uh, about the uh, First Continental Congress, uh, telling students the number of these folks who are talking, hey, look, if they start talking about independence, you get up, you get out of there. That, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about changes. And, and, and we see that mimicked in Latin America. Uh, Argentina is going to be the very first country to act. Uh, they already have this racial homogeneity that I've talked about. They don't have the fear of triggering some sort of racial revolt. Uh, and so in 1809, uh, the city of Buenos Aires is simply going to declare unilateral free trade. What they want to do is trade with Great Britain. And that's what they're going to do. Uh, they are not yet talking about independence. Uh, but they simply remove the viceroy from power in Argentina uh, and take control themselves. So the town council, something called the Cabildo uh, of uh, Argentina, or rather Buenos Aires, simply going to step forward and take control, and a couple of years later, going to make an actual declaration of independence based upon Republican principles. Um, you can see that there will be some differences between what we're seeing proposed and followed in Latin America and what we see, of course, here in the United States. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, Argentina, they don't envision, at least initially, a single chief executive, but rather a triumvirate. So their office of president would be held by three individuals uh, acting as counterweights to one another rather than to one individual. Uh, their whole idea of checks and balances a little bit different. They would rather have these three chief executives checking one another's power than to have branches of the government checking one another's power. And again, it kind of goes back to the concern that a lot of Latin American elite had that given their historical experience, given their culture and what have you, uh, that they required a much stronger executive branch, again, central, centralized role. As I pointed out earlier, uh, Peru, it's going to be the holdout, uh, the one area that will ultimately be liberated from the outside uh, by Generals Bolivar and San Martin, uh, the very last of the Spanish colonies to be liberated. This doesn't come until 1825, uh, so roughly 15 years after violence breaks out in the Americas. Yes, ma'am? Do, do you think that that's because of the nature of the geography, just such isolation? of the natives and just their you know, inability to really get together and and for that to come from Now, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think that's a big part of it. I mean, e even today, you, you'll hear Peruvians talk about the two Perus. There's the Peru of the indigenous people who live up in the mountains, and they're all but... Yeah, that, that's exactly right. They, not, not even a monetary economy. Um, so, yeah, it's going to make it a lot more difficult. And, and, and in fact, you know, I, I remember the general truism of the American Revolution was that about a third of the people favored independence, about a third were royalists, and about a third were what do I need to, to be to get through the day. Uh, I think that was very much the case in many parts of Latin America. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right to point out there are going to be huge pockets that are all but unaffected by this until years later when legal changes begin to creep into their lives. So, for example, uh, many indigenous communities are going to lose the right to their communal land holdings. Well, that may not happen overnight. Now, it's going to be a very, very profound change somewhere down the road. But, yeah, I, I would argue that the difference between 1815, 1830, 1840, there are going to be parts of Latin America, not a thing has changed. Uh, but, yeah, ge geography is huge. And this is another one of Bolivar's concerns. Uh, when he was proposing his Republic of Gran Colombia, he's talking about Ecuador, Venezuela, uh, and Colombia. Uh, he would also like to add Peru and Bolivia. That's a huge chunk of real estate. And one of his concerns when he started advocating a stronger centralized role, and then eventually just saying, the heck with it, I just need to be dictator for life, um, was regionalism. And he argued it was really hard to assimilate people from all these different regions. They didn't want to take orders from Bogota. They had finally gotten rid of Madrid. Uh, why did they want to replace those bullies with the ones from Madrid? They, they wanted to rule their own affairs. And so Bolivar is very pointed, in fact, in the letter that uh, we photocopied for y'all, about talking about these pernicious influences of regionalism. And again, a lot of that's geography. Even, even a country like Mexico, there are pockets of Mexico that you could literally disappear into. 
Okay, so the revolution from below in Mexico, and I wanted to talk about Mexico and Venezuela. Uh, these are the two that I was interested in talking to you all about more at length, simply because they're the most complicated uh, of the independence movements. Again, in Argentina, it was about as simple as, let's declare independence and go home. In Peru, let's wait until somebody declares independence and forces the issue. In Brazil, they just sort of notice, as you'll see, that people are declaring themselves independent and they follow suit. There's a little bit more of a story than that. Uh, Mexico and Venezuela are the trouble spots. Uh, in Mexico, it starts with a Creole priest named Father Miguel Hidalgo. Uh, he is a voracious reader. Uh, he is incredibly well respected by his uh, Jesuit professors at the university. And yet this guy, what do you do with him? Uh, he believes in cohabitating. He believes in, well, having children out of wedlock. He believes that celibacy for priests is a joke. He preaches that the immaculate conception was not immaculate. Uh, he preaches that the Holy Trinity is, well, that's, that's kind of, they just simply keep moving this guy around from parish to parish, try to get him out of harm's way, get him away from people. Uh, but he is a Creole who absolutely sympathizes with the desire to reform Spanish rule in the Americas. Now, whether or not he's really, really a proponent of independence, kind of hard to tell. He doesn't leave a whole lot of written records behind. Mm -hmm. Well, you just answer one of my like, questions. My, my husband is doing his ancestry in New Mexico, mm -hmm. and there's absolutely no stigma on illegitimacy. And, right. and, um, and that's good because most of his family is illegitimate. But um, the other thing is, I, and I don't want to be guilty of wide generalizations in my classroom, but I think I am. But it, what I... No, what, in my study of Mexican history, uh, what seems to be true, and we do a lot of demographics because I teach human geography, is that maybe because of this guy, and it had to be many other priests like that, mm -hmm. Mexico is so much more thoroughly mestizo yes. than the other Latin American countries. So there, it's obvious there were people there. Maybe this guy started it, but it's sort of a general attitude of, yes, you don't have to be married, you can you can uh, cohabitate with anybody of any race, mm. and so it's just is that is that fair to say that that is more true in Mexico than the other? I don't know that it's more true. It certainly is true, you know. And uh, in in the early 1900s, there's a Mexican minister, uh, government minister, who writes a book called The Cosmic Race. And he says, oh, the wonderful thing about Mexico is we're not just white, we're not just Indian, we're not just, but we're the cosmic race, we're a little bit of everything. And I get joke with students that Father Miguel go, or he don't, he works tirelessly day and night to bring that about. He's not the only one. Uh, there's, there's a very popular book, academic text about uh, race in Venezuela called Café Ole, which is talking about this very thing, this willingness to uh, to um, cohabitate or intermingle uh, that does lead to huge mestizo populations. And, and even when talking about some of these guys, I, I discovered just the other day that somebody that I, I have uh, seen described as a mulatto, which means a, a product of European and African, for years and years and years and years, it being described as a mestizo. And I'm like, wait, did I get that wrong? And I go back, no, nobody really knows. Well, my students always want to know, is there a, is there a word for someone who is Indian and black. Yeah, Sambo. Say that again. Sambo. S-A-M. It's actually Z-A-M-B-O. Yeah, but like, like, like we pronounce Sambo, Sambo. Yes. Yeah. And is that book, is the book The Forging of the Cosmic Race, is that still held in esteem or not? I, I, I think as an ideal, yes. Uh, in reality, I don't think I've ever met any Mexicans who believe that somehow they had managed to become colorblind as a culture. I mean, all you have to do is turn on a telenovela, and you suddenly are treated to the world of incredibly wealthy, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, Spanish-speaking, but... You know. The whiter you are is still yeah. relevant down there, but still, you can't deny that the Mexicans are so much more mestizo than any other country. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, and, and part of it, too, a very, very small... European population, very few women from uh, Europe came over in the first couple of hundred years. Uh, and, and that's another issue, yeah, the, the business of illegitimacy uh, being accepted. Uh, we can go all the way back to Cortez. Cortez has a child out of wedlock with Dona Marina. He names that child in his will. 
So, so you know, it, it's not a case of, well, you know, I'm just another one of his... No, they, 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 uh, many of these conquistadors, they had wives back in the Caribbean or back in Spain, uh, but they did acknowledge their offspring in the Americas, which I, I think is very striking. Uh, e. Hidalgo uh, is a Creole. Uh, what he would like to do is to establish a Creole-led junta in Mexico. Uh, this conspiracy will be found out ahead of time, and uh, many of his co-conspirators are going to be arrested, and he's going to be forced to act. He can simply turn himself in, or maybe he can try to have the revolution without them. Uh, he is going to attempt to do the latter, and, and that's where the whole uh, Grito de Dolores comes from. Uh, the uh, 16th of September is the, uh, is the annual celebration of Mexican independence. What it's really celebrating is uh, Father Hidalgo ringing the bells of the parish church and uh, advocating his uh, Indian parishioners to rise up against Spanish misrule. Uh, he is not going to be long for the world. He'll be dead within a year. Uh, and then the reins are going to be taken up by Father uh, Jose Maria Morelos. Uh, and Morelos is around until about 1815, before he too meets an untimely end. Uh, the advantage in dealing with Morelos, at least from our perspective, he writes things down. He actually has some coherent ideas, and so uh, some of these I've shared with you in the reading, so they actually have some primary sources. I, I, I like this idea of asking students to compare, for example, some of the ideas that we might find in, for example, the uh, Congress of Chilpancingo uh, to some of those found in the American Declaration of Independence or even Constitution. Uh, students seem to enjoy that. They seem to be pretty good at that. Uh, but again, also very revealing uh, when you're reading, uh, uh, reading uh, uh, Morelos' sentiments that he's adamant that for all the various liberal kinds of reforms he would like to see, like a at least indirectly represent, uh, representative government, uh, he wants no weakening of the church. Uh, he wants no secularization of the state and, uh, and the church. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, it, when we sometimes think about the liberal influences uh, on the revolutionary movements in Latin America, uh, there certainly are some very liberal in the 19th century uh, 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 sense of the word um, uh, dynamics to the movement. And then there are some things that seem really out of place, like this desire to embrace the status quo with regard to the church. And you might say, well, he was a priest. What do you expect? Uh, a lot of non-priests are going to embrace that as well uh, for a number of reasons, uh, not the least of which is that, again, if we put ourselves in the minds of folks who are very afraid of the populations surrounding them, what one institution historically has been able to wield or exert control over those populations better than the church itself? So uh, in many cases, the church is seen as a necessary evil. At the very least, we need the church to maintain its authority and influence over the people. Uh, in the case of Mexico, uh, we have a Mexican statesman and politician named Lucas Alamán uh, who argued that the church's role in modern or national Republican Mexico should be the same as it had been in colonial Mexico, uh, if for no other reason than the Catholic faith was the sole tie binding all Mexicans. And this is when they start getting into these discussions. Well, what does it mean to be Mexican? Does it mean that we're white? No, probably not. Does it mean that we're Indi Indian? No, maybe not. Does it mean that we're a uh, The one thing they can all agree, we're, we're Catholic. And so, uh, again, we're going to find what might strike us as being somewhat unprogressive or unliberal sentiments cropping up in the midst of these otherwise very, very liberal documents and movements. And again, these two guys, they are seen as scary, dangerous, uh, by people like uh, Agustin de Iturbide or Santa Ana of Mexico, both of whom represent uh, the more elite you know, white European factions. So in Mexico, we're going to have a counter-revolution uh, involving some Creoles and Spaniards uh, versus a true revolutionary movement from Vilo composed of some Creoles and, of course, people of color. And uh, yeah, this, this becomes really odd later on. Uh, so you know, the period I study is immediately after independence. I'm interested in what changes have or have not taken place. Uh, imagine these town councils getting together, uh, and you realize that literally the person sitting across the table from you fought on the other side during the revolution. And that, that, that's precisely what we end up dealing with. 
uh, are people that are changing sides. Sometimes they are literally uh, both people who grew up in the same social class. Uh, they're both of European descent. Uh, they're both you know, fairly wealthy, influential people. One is fighting on behalf of those from below. One is fighting on behalf of those from above. Uh, and again, they don't forget these things. And so you know, it took me in, in one particular case about six or seven months of digging through documents before I finally had my aha moment. And I realized that these two individuals in this town council who can't agree on anything, they've got a history. And it dates back to this period here. So here we have uh, Itribide, uh, who's going to unite the nation under his own rule in 1823. And, and there again, I provided his uh, three guarantees document uh, as a way of taking a look at whether or not the Mexico that first emerges in 1823 uh, is in fact representative, liberal, or in any ways bound by some of the same ideological considerations uh, as we might find the United States. And there again, you might ask the question of, well, what about this government uh, that Itribide is heading uh, might uh, bear a resemblance to its northern counterpart? What, what, what ultimately does not? All right, Venezuela, very similar story. Um, in the case of uh, Venezuela, of course, it's easiest to focus on the character of Simon Bolivar, the great liberator, an incredibly, incredibly an influential uh, and prolific uh, individual, uh, has left behind some 20 plus odd volumes of correspondence. So as historians, we just love this guy because he couldn't shut up uh, when he was writing. Uh, at least we know what he was thinking or what he claimed to have been thinking. Uh, he also uh, clearly very charismatic figure. Uh, literally, he's the kind of guy that turns heads uh, anywhere he goes. Uh, and he's even something of a tragic figure. Uh, he's born in 1783. He's an orphan by the time he's nine years old. And he will be sent to Spain uh, to continue his studies, uh, in his case, in the military. And uh, it will be while in Spain that he gets his hands on some of the forbidden literature uh, and takes up his lifelong love of Enlightenment era writers and philosophers. Uh, by 1805, he will be writing in personal correspondence or private correspondence that someday he too hopes to do for his country what Napoleon had done for France and that is to lead it into a new era. So he, he, he's really a firebrand. He's, he's the Sam Adams of South America in that he's already thinking of independence and Republican, in fact, I think he refers to them as representative institutions in the letter, uh, well before many of his counterparts. Uh, that doesn't mean that that's what he will immediately strike out to achieve, but that, that, that's ultimately what his goal will be. Uh, when he returns to America, uh, in 1809, uh, he returns with a young wife uh, who dies within just a couple of months of her arrival in the Americas. Uh, so here we have Bolivar. He's an orphan. Now he's a widower. Uh, he will never remarry, although he will take countless mistresses. Uh, but again, he's something of a tragic and sad figure, although again, he's also one who is very, very well respected. Uh, Bolivar is going to throw his support behind the other planting class elite of Venezuela uh, in 1810 and 1811. So all they're going to simply do is say, hey, look, over in Spain, the elite or the nobility, has, they, they formed, a, formed a junta. Uh, they're going to operate through representative rule. They've written a constitution, or at least in the process of doing so. Uh, what, what, what can we do? And so uh, Bolivar, very supportive of Francisco Miranda's efforts to do exactly the same in Venezuela. And in fact, uh, they are initially fairly successful. This is gonna be a Creole-led operation. They're not talking about abolishing slavery. They're not talking about equality uh, before the law. They're simply talking about improving their own respective lots. In short, what they're really trying to do is undo some of the damage that they believe was inflicted by the Bourbon reforms. Now, when the royalists become involved, uh, first, they discover, uh, rather that is the Spanish, that uh, there are pockets of royalist sentiment within Venezuela, and those can be tapped into. Uh, we also have a large population of color that is none too keen to be discovering that, well, there's a movement afoot to change things, but not to our benefit. 
Uh, and so we're going to start to see separate revolutions occurring within the Venezuelan revolution. Uh, it's going to be very confusing, uh, especially for the first couple of years. Uh, simply know that we have two to three different parties all fighting for different objectives. And that, again, makes it easy for the Spanish to divide and conquer. Uh, the other really important character in the Venezuela story uh, is General and, and uh, soon to be President for Life, uh, Jose Antonio Paez. Uh, and he represents the Llaneros, or these uh, people of color who live in the interior and who are generally cowboys. He, he's a mulatto, so he's descended of uh, African and Spanish parents. And uh, he is illiterate, and he's wanted by the law uh, at the time that the independence movements break out in, uh, in the Americas. However, on the field of battle, he's going to prove himself to be such a capable leader of men that he's going to quickly start rising through the ranks, and then he's going to take it upon himself to become self-educated to learn how to read and write. Uh, what he desires most is the abolition of slavery and greater rights for non-whites in Venezuela. Uh, what Bolivar has sided with is a largely white upper-class movement simply hoping to improve their own lot. Uh, this all ends by 1814 with Bolivar living in exile, first in Jamaica and then in Haiti. And it'll be while living in both Jamaica and Haiti uh, that Bolivar has his epiphany, or epiphanies, plural. Uh, not the least of which involves the need to bury the hatchet, close the ranks, and fight the Spaniards as a united American people. Uh, so he finds very quickly that promising to abolish slavery not only brings him perhaps unexpected allies, it also guarantees him material assistance from the now independent nation of Haiti. Uh, this is going to be a double whammy uh, for the Spanish because Simone Bolivar is going to come back uh, to the Americas. He's going to immediately unite with Jose Antonio Paez. And here we see the two of them. Um, oops, yeah, down here. Uh, I think this is at the Battle of, oh, there's Boyaca, the very, very, very last battle. Uh, we see uh, Bolivar and Paez celebrating here. Uh, but in any case, he comes back, he's got more men than ever, there are fewer divisions than ever, and maybe most importantly, he's got the money with which to prosecute this revolution. Uh, from that point forward, uh, Bolivar is really on the roll. And so he's going to be working across the top of South America and down through the Andes. At the same time, the General San Martin is working his way across the southern cone uh, and north through the Andes. And of course, they're ultimately going to uh, end up meeting in Peru. Just a couple of dates here, so... Incidentally, this uh, so-called First Republic, uh, which lasts from roughly 1811 to 1813, it's known in, uh, in Venezuelan history as La República Bobo, uh, basically the Republic of Dunces, a bunch of idiots running the show. That's how it's actually remembered in the, in, in the history books. Uh, Miranda was not much of a political leader. Bolivar was too busy, you know, running off fighting battles. Uh, and so as a result, uh, not a very successful first experiment for Venezuela. Okay, and finally, how about Brazil? Uh, well, Brazil takes a completely different path to independence. Uh, Brazil's king, uh, Emperor John or Joao VI, uh, in 1808, with Spanish forces reeling uh, beneath the onslaught of French invasion, uh, invasion forces, uh, instead of waiting around to be captured, like Ferdinand VII in Spain, uh, John VI immediately signs a treaty with Great Britain, which was Portugal's historical enemy, uh, to allow Britain to begin using Portuguese ports to land troops to fight the French. In the meantime, John is taking no chances. He literally packs up the entire Portuguese court and moves to Rio de Janeiro. Uh, initially, he seems to think that this will be a short-term event. Then he discovers that both he and his family absolutely love Brazil. And so even once the Napoleonic Wars in uh, Europe have ended, John shows no inclination of returning home. 
what he would like to do uh, is continue to rule the Portuguese Empire, uh, not from the Kingdom of Portugal, but from the now independent Kingdom of Brazil. And after all, who could be happier? Uh, well, in 1822, rather 1821, uh, the Portuguese nobility decide they want John VI back. Now, John had been hoping to arrange to get his niece to assume the throne of Portugal. Uh, she was going to be blocked by other members of the family, and so John VI very, very reluctantly does return to Portugal, but only after leaving his son Pedro I in charge. And uh, there's an apocryphal conversation, of course, that historians have talked about probably for hundreds of years, in which uh, John is alleged to have said to Pedro that, hey, look, yeah, if things get a little bit wild and crazy in the next couple of years, and you start saying that the Brazilians really want to pursue independence, uh, especially if things aren't going so well between Brazil and Portugal, the best place for you to be would be at the head of that movement. And that is essentially what is going to happen uh, when in September of 1822, Dom Pedro I uh, declares the independence of Brazil largely to ensure that Brazil does not lose what it has gained uh, since the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars. So what that means is that uh, Brazil is actually going to have the uh, least problematic uh, path from colony to independence. It also has the most continuity. Uh, there is virtually no economic disruption. Mexico and Venezuela will be savaged by economic disruption. Um, in the case of Brazil, we have continuity. They're still being ruled by a Bourbon monarch. It is still a monarchy, albeit a constitutional monarchy, by the 1820s. Uh, nowhere else in uh, Latin America do we find this continuity. And this is something I point out with regard to Mexico, Venezuela. Uh, all of a sudden, after essentially 400 uh, years, the decision has been made to completely change the rules of the game. The problem now is who gets to decide what the new rules are. Uh, that's not an issue in Brazil for quite some time. Uh, so, if we're looking back over the independence movements in the Americas, absolutely no doubt uh, that the success of the American Revolution speaks volumes to our Latin American counterparts. Uh, some of them are, again, so enamored with what we are doing in the United States that they hope to recreate the, our experiment writ large. Uh, but most of them fall back upon what I think we would argue today is a very racist or racial explanation that uh, for reasons of ignorance, vice, superstition, etc., uh, we simply aren't cut from the same cloth and we would not be as successful as the Americans. And of course, other Latin American leaders would simply point out that we just didn't have the experience with self-rule that our British American counterparts had. Uh, it bears remembering that all colonies in Latin America were royal colonies. Right? These weren't charter colonies, these weren't uh, places where an awful lot of self-rule was encouraged, which isn't to say that it didn't at times take place. Uh, but again, I think the American Revolution far more important as a symbol of what can be accomplished than what should be accomplished. Uh, by the same token, uh, we're going to find that some of the very ideas, you know, these ideas coming from the Enlightenment that drove the American Revolution, they're, they're clearly present and in force in Latin America as well. Uh, but again, the overriding concern across Latin America, and this is one of the reasons why, uh, if, if you were going to if you're going to really try to pigeonhole me and ask me, well, were the revolutionary movements or the independence movements in Latin America essentially liberal or essentially conservative, I'd probably lean more to the latter, even though I could certainly offer you examples, and uh, Argentina might be a good example of this, uh, of movements that were very, very liberal, representative, embodied a lot of the same ideas we'd see in the United States. But uh, elsewhere in Latin America, where racial concerns are more paramount, we're going to find that those revolutions are far more conservative. Uh, in fact, uh, in both Venezuela and Mexico, one of the greatest concerns came after the Napoleonic Wars had ended, after Ferdinand VII had taken the throne back. Uh, everybody assumed that the very first thing Ferdinand would do would be to tear up this very liberal constitution uh, that the Spanish nobility had drafted. No. He was forced to embrace it, to endorse it. 
uh, and that really scared uh, the Mexican and Venezuelan Creoles. Uh, in particular, what scared them were the Constitution's efforts to defang the Catholic Church. And as I've already indicated, they saw the church's existence or continued existence and role as paramount in controlling the populations around them. Uh, so they thought that anything that weakened the church uh, would be doing them absolutely no good in the long run. Uh, the other concern, interestingly enough, that many Creoles in the Americas had uh, was over the Spanish nobility's desire to see equality before the law become part of the Constitution. And uh, again, for the most part, the Creoles that I'm talking about were not people who wanted equality before the law for everyone, they wanted it for themselves. Yeah. So again, on the whole, talking about fairly conservative movements, and again, movements that uh, when I was in grad school were still being characterized largely as counter-revolutionary uh, as opposed to revolutionary. Alrighty, folks, I would love to open it up to questions from y'all or things that I might be able to talk about or shed further light on.